This video is for days 8 and 9 of the short read sequencing analysis workshop. This is video 5, Gene Level Differential Expression Analysis with DESeq2. DESeq2 is one of the most commonly used R packages for performing statistical testing on count data in order to identify genes with significant changes in expression levels between experimental conditions. First, let's briefly outline the theoretical model that undergirds DESeq2 before we step through how one would run it. As has been briefly mentioned before, the basic assumption made in the model is that the counts for a given gene, lowercase y, in a given sample are drawn from a negative binomial distribution with a mean mu and dispersion alpha. Remember that the dispersion parameter is the coefficient of the quadratic term of the variance. In our notation, lowercase g is the index for the gene and lowercase i is the index for the sample. Note that the model makes the assumption that the dispersion parameter does not vary between samples. Furthermore, the model assumes that the mean read count for a given gene and sample is directly related to the true biological concentration of that gene, q sub gi, scaled by a sample-specific normalization factor, s sub i. A general linear model is then fit to the concentration with a logarithmic link function. Here, lowercase x represents the design matrix, and beta relates to the log fold change of gene g. To clarify this general linear model, let's consider a simple two-level experiment, each with two replicates. The design matrix and beta parameters would be given by the following matrix and vector. Once beta g sub g has been computed, the log fold change for a given gene can be calculated thusly. As stated in a previous video, there are many different methods of count normalization. DSeq2 has yet another approach to it. It's called the median of ratios method. This method results in the sample specific size factor, S sub i, calculated as shown here. DESeq2 assumes that most genes are unchanging. Thus, all the size factors should be quite close to unity. If any samples deviate dramatically from one, you may want to consider excluding those from your analysis. Once you've loaded in your data into R and formatted it as a DESeq data structure, you can check the size factor of your samples using the estimate size factors routine. Here we see an example of some samples with size factors much lower and higher than 1. If a size factor is much smaller than 1, it indicates that particular sample has much lower than average coverage, compared to other samples, and vice versa for larger size factors. Running DSeq2 consists of the following steps. 1. Load in or ge and generate matrix of count data. Two. Define your sample table with treatment conditions. Three, define your design matrix. Four, build your DESeq data structure. Five, optionally you can filter out lowly expressed features. This will speed up computing process. The computing process. Six, run the DESeq method. This is where the computing dispersion estimates, fitting the GLM, and calculating the log fold change occurs. Seven set your significance threshold, 8. Extract significant results, 9. Perform log fold change shrinkage for the purpose of downstream visualization, and finally, sort, filter, and save your results. We'll now go through these steps in a script one at a time. The very first thing you will do, uh, want to do is to load the DESeq2 library. Here we previously computed our count data using feature counts and saved it, along with a sample conditions table, to an R data file. So for the first two steps, we simply load in the R data file using the load function. In our workspace, we can see the coverage data object, which contains our count matrix, as well as the sample table, which is named file table. Let's look at the sample table to see how it's formatted. Calling file table, you can see we have six SRR samples. The first column is the BAM file name. The second and third column columns 
function as sample identifiers, and the final column, named condition, is the type of treatment. You can see we have three different conditions, each with two replicates. For step three and four, we must take our conditions table and define our design matrix. In DESeq2, the design matrix is constructed and stored in the DESeq data structure. But for a simple treatment versus control comparison, the design matrix will look like this one specified here. Now we can create our DESeq data structure by calling the DESeq data, data set from matrix routine. We assign the counts table to the count data parameter, the sample table to the call dat data parameter, and since we're doing a simple treatment versus control comparison, we set the design matrix parameter to be proportional to condition. The name, <coughs> names of the terms in the design matrix equation must be the same as the names in the sample table. We've assigned the output to the new variable DDS. We can now look at the contents of the DESeq data structure by calling it by name. Here we see a lot of metadata in addition to the counts table. Furthermore, we can see that the contents of the sample table is now contained in the column data, which can be displayed with the function call data. Next, we have the option of filtering out lowly expressed genes prior to calling the main DESeq routine. Calling DESeq with our, <clears throat> with our data structure as the input it will indicate the various steps it is performing. Here we've assigned the output to a new variable, DEDDS. Looking at the contents of this output, we see all of the metadata transferred over from our original data structure. It is from this new data object we've created that we can extract our dispersion estimates, log fold changes, and significant results. At this point, let's look at the dispersion estimates that DESeq2 computed. Using the plot disp ests routine with our DEDDS object as an input, we can see the original dispersion estimates in black dots, as well as the fitted dispersion trend line in red. A major assumption made is that the dispersion parameter will be higher for genes with lower average counts, regardless of the length of the gene or what sample it is in. And this value will decrease to a constant value for higher average count genes. The final shrunken dispersion estimates are shown in blue. Recall that the dispersion parameter related to the mean count value to, uh, to the variance of our negative binomial distribution. Now to define our significance threshold and extract significant results. Here we set out our set our significance level to 0 0.05 and defined the two conditions we want to compare, which have been assigned to variables treatment and control. We then use the results routine to extract from our DEDDS object significant genes for the specified comparison at the specified significance level. Finally, we perform log fold shrinkage on the results. This last step does not change any of the significant results, but instead it helps to reduce the background noise, which will improve visualization of the data. At this point, let's look at the format of the results object we just created. One can see that the rows correspond to the genes, with the first column being the gene IDs. The second column is the baseline average expression level. The third and fourth columns are the log fold change in its standard error. The fifth column is the result of the statistical test used to determine significance. And lastly, the adjusted p-values are found in the seventh column. Finally, the results can be sorted and or filtered, say by log fold change or adjusted p-value. Results can be saved either to an R data file or exported to a CVS for further downstream analysis and visualization.